Welcome to the Triangle Microworks IEC 608-70-5 Communication Protocol Training Videos. This video will give a brief overview of the 608-70-5 protocol, which sometimes I'll refer to simply as 608-70, and will also contrast the protocol somewhat with the Distributed Networking Protocol, or DNP3, which I'll sometimes abbreviate as DNP. The complete training consists of five videos. This first video contains an introduction and provides an overview of the protocol layers in IEC 608-70-5. It also dives into the stack layers, particularly with regards to 608-70-5-101 and-104. The second video goes into detail about ASDUs, or application-specific data units. The third video describes the application layer, and the fourth video discusses the link, transport, and physical layers diving into a little bit more detail about polling, controls, and the link layer in general. And then the fifth and final video describes security in 608.70-5 and provides the conclusion. All right, so let's start with a quick history of 608.70-5. This protocol goes way back to the early 1990s. Uh, they started working on standardizing a protocol for telecontrol and SCADA systems. The first subpart was published in 1990 and the original subparts talked mostly about the lower level layers. And finally in 1995, the 101 spec came into being. Uh, the 101 spec basically leveraged all of the original subparts. In 2000, the 104 spec was introduced, um, which is very similar to 101, but focused more on the TCP IP applications, whereas 101 is serial. DNP is also based in part on the 608.70-5 subparts. Um, so it is somewhat similar. So throughout this presentation, we'll point out some of the major differences between the two standards. In the standardization effort, there were a lot of objectives for SCADA. Uh, basically, the main idea is to be able to send data from the outstation or the remote device to the master. Uh, also, they wanted to be able to send controls from the master to the outstation and to do both of those in a very reliable way. So the protocol includes some quality bits and a CRC and checksum to make sure the data and the messages are correct. Another goal of the protocol was to make sure that bandwidth was optimized uh, so it's not sending a lot of unnecessary messages. Now remember in the early 90s, uh, bandwidth was pretty expensive. So unlike today where we kind of take gigabit ethernet for granted, uh, when you're dealing with dial-up lines or slower, um, Minimizing protocol overhead is a big concern. The design committees also wanted to provide the ability to have timestamps and other functions like that. Uh, and some security aspects were recently added in order to prevent unauthorized access. One of the most important goals was to serve as an open standard so that you would have interoperability among different vendors. Something we kind of take for granted now, but was a pretty big deal in the early 1990s. Obviously, there's a lot of benefits to open standards. Uh, you're probably aware of many of them, including interoperability among vendors and fewer protocols to support for utilities. In the case of IEC 608.70-5, there's really not an official users group. Uh, the protocol is controlled by the IEC working group, and that working group meets on an as-needed basis. In recent years, the working group has mostly been focused on work relating to security features. 608.70-5 is primarily used in Europe and in the Middle East, but in several other parts of the world as well. Basically, uh, it's either DNP3 or 608.70-5, uh, which is primarily used for distributed SCADA systems. Kind of a general rule of thumb, and it is just a rule of thumb, so of course there are exceptions, but the general rule of thumb is that English-speaking countries tend to prefer DNP3, whereas non-English-speaking countries tend to prefer 608.70-5. Uh, 608.70-5 is being used primarily for electric utilities, but we are seeing it be used in some other industries as well. DNP3 went into other industries a little bit faster, but 608.70-5 is spreading. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, security features have been recently added to the protocol. If you look at the standard itself, there's several different parts. It's an IEC standard, so the IEC typically likes to break things up into lots of different parts. If you're familiar with 61850, there are lots and lots of parts to that standard. 
uh, and 60870-5 is kind of similar. In 60870-5, the first parts here basically are talking about the different layers. So for example, dash 5 dash 2 is primarily talking about how the link layer is built up. 5.3 through 5.5 five are focused on the application layer. Uh, and so it's following that, that IEC architecture, kind of a similar way that 61850 does. In the first five sections, it's talking in kind of a very generic way. And then in the 101, 102, 103, and 104 sections, they're basically referencing the first five sections and explaining how those layers can be used to accomplish these different requirements. 101 is designed for serial-based communications for telecontrol. 102 is used for sending measurements. 103 for protection functions for substations. And 104 is really telecontrol for 101 that maps to TCP IP. So it's kind of building up the different layers and referencing several different standards in the overall architecture. One big difference here is that DNP3, once it was standardized by the IEEE, Everything was put into one document, which is kind of convenient. The IEC does not work that way because of the way it's architected, and so you have these several different sections. All right, let's move on into the real stuff. 60870-5 is designed to support several different topologies, very similar to DNP3. One of the more common topologies is where you have a controlling station and individual point-to-point -point connections to the controlled stations. I should point out that 60870-5 uses this terminology of controlling station and controlled station, while DNP3 uses master and outstation. So the controlling station in 60870-5 is equivalent to a master station in DNP3, and a controlled station in 60870-5 is the same as an outstation in DNP3. They're basically the same, just different names. Much like DNP3 serial connection, 60870-5 can also support a multipoint topology. There's a couple of different names for this, but basically in 101, it uses the unbalanced mode, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, this supports where a controlling station can connect to several controlled stations on a common physical layer, and then pull those stations using the link layer without having any collisions. So that's basically used for multi-drop serial support. And of course, with the point-to-point -point approach, hypothetically, you can also have multiple controlling stations for a single controlled station. This isn't really addressed in the standard, but the point-to-point -point approach would support that. When we get into the layers of the stack, there are some major differences between 101 and 104. In this section, I'll point out a few of those differences. The 101 stack is based on the Enhanced Performance Architecture, or EPA, which is the same architecture that DNP3 is based on. However, DNP adds a transport function, sometimes called a pseudo transport layer, which is not used in 101. So basically you just have in 101, the three layers, there's the application layer, the link layer, and a physical layer. The application layer, of course, deals with all of the data objects, polling, reading, creating events, sending commands, supporting timestamps, and clock synchronization, all those kinds of things. The link layer is really there to provide things like the checksums to make sure that messages are sent without errors. Uh, there's also the ability to have addressing at the link layer, so that's very similar to DNP3, and that feature helps support multi-drop topology. It also supports link layer confirmations, and with one special case in 101 with multi-drop, it allows the master to control how the outstations are replying. Uh, that's especially used for things like polling. But that's what the link layer is for, and of course the physical layer is intended to support serial applications. In the standard, they reference V.24 and V.28. This is basically the equivalent of RS-232 and RS-485 serial. Of course, you can support other serial mediums like serial radios as well. Uh, so that's very similar to DNP3. The only big difference here, as I mentioned a minute ago, DNP has that transport function which can break up the application messages, uh, but that is not done in 101. The 104 layer is dramatically different, and this is because of the common architecture that IEC defines. Basically, everything under the application layer is completely different, and it's mapped to the TCP IP protocol suite. So the application layer is basically the same as 101. Um, it has ASDUs, which I'll get into in a moment, um, they're basically the same with a few differences. 
but there's a special 104 application to the TCP interface, which we refer to as the 104 link layer. And this is basically put in since you don't have the link layer that you have with 101. So they added this in to add some of the same capabilities and to interface to the TCP part of the stack. After that, everything is basically the standard TCP IP layers. Uh, so of course it does support ethernet. So there's a big difference here with DNP3 because the way DNP3 interfaces with TCP IP is to take the entire protocol stack and encapsulate it in a TCP IP message. Uh, whereas in 104, they actually pull out the link layer and replace it with the TCP IP stack. So that's a fairly big difference between DNP3 and 60870-5. The 101 and 104 application layers basically provide the same functionality, so it includes things like addressing for data objects, data transfer and processing capabilities, control operations, and polling. We'll get into all of these and basically how that's structured in just a bit. I pointed out one big difference here in the polling, which we'll get into in more detail, but basically there's no equivalent to polling for a sequence of events like you have in DNP3. So we'll talk about what that means in a little bit more detail later. Some of the big differences at the application layer between 60870-5 and DNP3 are shown in this slide. In 60870-5, you're only limited to one data type per message. In DNP3, you can mix data types if you want to. 60870-5 also limits you to controlling one point per message, unlike DNP3, which can allow multiple points to be controlled in one message. And 60870-5 does not have the equivalent to DNP3 where the master can confirm that it's received events before the outstation clears its buffer. Uh, the standard does kind of refer to an option of using link confirms before clearing the buffer. Uh, and I want to point out that we do that in the Triangle Microwork stack. So the Triangle Microwork stack uses link confirms to try to verify that events were received by the master before those events are cleared from the buffer. 60870-5 has no equivalent to DNP's internal indication bits. There are some similar capabilities, although it's not implemented in the same way at all. Instead of the IIN bits, probably the most similar thing in 60870-5 is the cause of transmission, which is included in the ASDU. With 60870-5, there's also a different way of addressing data. Uh, there's a capability to have multiple sectors to differentiate the data address space. We'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a bit as well. So those are kind of the high level differences. And as we go on, on several of the slides, I'll point out specific things that are different. So this concludes the first video on the introduction and protocol layers overview. So please continue on to the second video in the series, ASDUs.